Thank you, Sable, for that. It's very beautiful. Um, next, I'd just like to let you know that tomorrow, um, sorry, at the University of Calgary in the Bianca Room, is the book launch of author Joan Crate. And in the afternoon will be panel discussions starting at 2 p.m. Uh, with the title is Productive Tensions Within Aboriginal Writing, which is also being held in the Bianca Room. Um, and the panelists are Beverly Hungry Wolf, Sharon Pearl Turner, Lee Miracle, and jo Gregory Schofield. Our next author is Beverly Hungry Wolf. Beverly Hungry Wolf was born on the Blood Indian Reserve in Canada, and she is a member of the Little Bear family, the Blood Tribe, and the Blackfoot Nation. She was educated at the, at the boarding school on the reserve, and after finishing her college education, returned to the reserve as a teacher. She married a German, Adolf Lutherborn, okay. <laughs> that was going to be hard when I knew it, who encouraged her to preserve her traditions. Together they wrote Shadows of the Buffalo, which tells of their experiences. Her other publications include The Ways of My Grandmothers and Daughters of the Buffalo Women, Maintaining Tribal Faith. Thank you, Beverly Hungry. I was going to um, read from my script, but I was enjoying uh, Daughters of the Buffalo Women, so I thought I would use that. <coughs> I would read from that. Um, the story I'm going to read first, um, I got from my mother, and it's a real cute story. There were two boys in our school. One name was Albert and the other was Eugene, who were known for being naughty and getting into trouble. One time they got a hold of some nun's clothes and put them on. They went outside to one end of the schoolyard and they started walking back and forth each with a prayer book in his hand, acting like they were studying the Bible. They probably did this to stay out of school. Well, Father Rio noticed them and said something in French, to which one of them answered, Oui, monsieur. But they kept walking. On their way back, he said something in French again, but he uh, but got the same answer, oui, monsieur. At this point, Father Rio got suspicious, so he went over to take a closer look, and here it was Albert and Eugene. Well, those boys hiked up their skirts and started to run with Father Rio behind, trying to kick their rear ends. But the whole time he was laughing so hard, he had to stop and take a breather, then chase after them again. The whole school got a big laugh out of this. Um, a lot of our people did healing, and this healing was kind of spiritual healing. Um, one of my brothers, um, he's quite famous, his name is Leroy Little Bear. And um, he was really, really sickly when he was a child. And so they used to have to do, have these healing ceremonies for him. And, and my mother told me about this one time she did the healing herself. There was another time that your brother also got sick and the memory of the doctrine on that occasion now makes me laugh. Though at the time we were pretty worried, I had been at home alone with him. While we were, um, while we were living in a log house next door to my grandparents, he started to get um, spasms, so I quickly wrapped him up in a blanket and rushed him over to the old folks, since they were good at doctrine. Someone had told me that when Leroy got convulsions, I should put him in some mustard water. I was willing to try any remedy, so I kept some of it on hand. 
But when the time came, I was too excited, so I just ran out. By the time, he was unconscious, so I handed him to my grandparents and told them, told them to take care of him. While I rushed back for the dish of water, when I returned with it, the old folks were singing away. My grandfather, Heavy Head, was beating on a rawhide drum. And my grand Heavy Head was going through his... My grandmother was beating on a rawhide drum. My grandfather, Heavy Head, was going through his doctoring motions. He had his eyes closed. And Grandma's eyes are closed, too. I just rushed up grabbed Leroy by the ankles and dunked him into the mustard water. He cried out, which really surprised the old folks. They were looking on the floor and he wasn't there because my mom had taken him away. They were really puzzled. Those Indian doctors had supernatural powers. They didn't just heal people in the ordinary way. They were very private with those powers. They kept them secret. They always had them along, but they usually wouldn't talk about them. If someone gets power, they don't broadcast it. They'll just keep it to themselves. Then, then, uh, then too, they're not sure at first if it will really happen. Uh, Tonight I'm going to read something that I uh, that I just did. I um, I uh, finally got my part of my uh, manuscript um, copied. I had a I was going to read it at the other place and share it with you, but I'll share some of it with you now. Uh, this is my first movie. I I. I went from the printed word to to movies to reach more people, especially our young people. Um, I'm just going to talk about how um, my heroine is named Ali, and uh, how she accepts this power and the old lady that she uh, works with, Bertha. I'll read you the teaser too. At the base of a misty waterfall, two Indian women walk through the mist hand in hand. They are Ali Medicine Horse, Horse Medicine, 17, Blackfoot proud, headstrong, matriarchal. Her eyes hold a fierceness more at home in a warrior. Granny, 70, Blackfoot, a wise elder and a sweetheart. Ali slips on the wet river stones, grabs at, uh, Granny's hand to steady herself. The sound of pounding drums rise from the roar of the waterfall. Granny nudges Ali, points to, to her with her chin like a creep <laughs> to the top of the waterfalls. The silhouette of an Indian woman dressed in pure white buckskin stands on a rock. This is Running Eagle, the spitting image of Ellie. But she stands tall, proud, and firm. Whoosh! They stand beside Running Eagle. Ellie looks at her in adoration as the drumming becomes louder, faster. Running Eagle, some misa. Look at them, they're very greedy. Running Eagle pivots and points. Two men, one large, one small, in full regalia, faces painted. Watch out for them. The men sink into a bloody oily liquid as the small one's long, bony hands fill the screen, reaching out for Ellie. That's the teaser. I'm going to read to you the parts of where Ali gets directed to this old lady named Bertha, who helps.
helps her accept Running Eagle. Ellie suddenly snaps upright in bed. She takes a moment to get her bearings, then slides out of bed. We follow Ellie down the dark hallway to Grandma's room. Ellie climbs into bed with Granny. She nuzzles in close, pulls Granny, Granny's arms around her. Granny, gedankish, what are you doing? Ellie, I had a dream again. Granny, did, did she scare you? Ellie, no. It was like she was trying to tell me something. I'm just, I'm just not sure what it was. Ellie shifts face Granny. Granny, pray to her for guidance. She will give you a gift. We will ask Bertha a question. Ellie, Bertha? No, she scares me. Granny play playfully pokes at Ellie. You should be scared of her. She has power. Um, Bertha Two Rider, 60 to 70 year old lady, Blackfoot wise, humorous, has no social filter. Bertha's hair is straw like and wiry. She wears layered clothing, little leather pouches around her neck and on her belt. Bertha holds the phone. This is after uh, I killed off the, the mother and the father and the grandmother. I had to kill three people by page nine. <laughs> and so um, uh, Jane is the social worker and she's just trying to comfort um, Bertha because her, her best friend had just died. Bertha, um, Jane. Bertha, I'm going to come over as soon as I can. I just don't want you to hear about it on the radio. Tears flow freely down Bertha's face. Ah, damas, kanitakao. Yes, my poor friend. Ali phoned about an hour ago. Jane, I'll come get you. Bertha, you go take care of the children. I'll be over after church services. <coughs> After the funeral, then Bertha comes to talk to Ellie. Ellie sits cross-legged on her bed, looking at college catalogs. She holds them to her chest and weeps silently. Ellie hears singing outside her window. She moves to the open window and look out. Ellie, what now? Bertha keeps keeps beat to her song, song, dancing as she sings in a high-pitched tone. She stops. The, her in, Ellie's Indian name is Wave Woman. Water waves. Ellie opens the door as Bertha dances in and gets right in Ellie's face. She dances to Ellie and up close Bertha wraps her arms around Ali. Oh, my girl, Damaska, my poor girl. After a, mer after a moment, Bertha releases Ali and follows her to the kitchen table. Ali puts the kettle on to boil, then moves to the cupboard and pulls out a package of muffins. Ali, what kind of tea would you like? Gaksami, mint tea. Ali grabs cups and saucers, brings them to the table. Ali, what kind of muffin do you want? Bertha, straight face, stud muffin. Haven't had one of those in a while. Ali can't hide her surprise at Bertha's response. Bertha bursts out laughing, winks at Ali. Ali, get <laughs> Bertha, I can't. I hear you kids talk. Ali and Bertha share a laugh. 
Ali pours tea. Bertha, I'm so happy one of our ancestors has come back to help us. Bertha pulls a pouch from her belt, puts it on the table. Your granny told me to come help you. Bertha gets up, adjusts her shawl. Oh, catch a bus scope. We're going to have a dance. Ellie, dance? Her parents had just died, so she was... It's the perfect time to have an honor dance. Ellie, honor dance? Bertha nods, stands by Ellie. Bake your granny and your parents lived a good life. We have to honor them. Bertha stands Ellie up. And we must honor you and the gift you've been given. Bertha starts to sing and dance. Ellie hangs back. Bertha grabs her hand and drags her along. Let's go, hurry up. Ali reluctantly dances besides Bertha. Bertha unwraps a pipe and starts smoking. Ali pours more tea. Smile, Ali, no need to be serious. That's running eagle. Bertha takes a long draw off her pipe. Bertha, running eagle, was smart, strong and smart. She's, she lost her parents and had to take care of her brothers and sisters. She hunted, went on war raids, even became a chief. The spirits don't choose lightly. Most people spend their lives searching for a guardian spirit, and you, Ellie, are chosen. Bertha holds up her hands on either side of Ellie's head and closes her eyes. You are destined for something great, Vita Mahgan. Now this is helping you down the road. Try hard, believe and she will help you. Bertha opens her eyes, takes a leather pouch off her belt. These will help you. Bita Mahgan will tell you how to use the paint. For now, put four dots across your forehead for strength. She opens another pouch, shows Ellie some crumbled leaves. If you need to use this medicine, wet it with your spit. Go ahead. It must be wet to work. Put it on any cut and it will heal clean. No scars will show. Ellie, okay. Bertha hands Ellie a small pipe. This was your granny's, Ellie's mom's pipe. She didn't know what to do with it. You'll need it on your journey. Ellie, journey? What are you talking about? Bertha suddenly reaches up her sleeve, pulls out a long braid of sweet grass. She gives it to Ellie. Bertha, pray. Bertha jumps up and heads to the door. When she comes again, come tell me. Ellie sits at the table looking at Bertha's gifts. Ellie's outside and she, she sees Running Eagle and Running Eagle tells her, come to me. So she phones Bertha right away. <clears throat> Bertha, okay. Bertha, something really weird just happened. Test up what is it? I was just outside and I heard singing that a lady told me I stood. Running Eagle told her, come here. Bertha, well then go to her. Go to her? Yes, where are your dreams of her the strongest? Ellie, in the mountains? Then go to the mountains. Ellie, go to the mountains. 
Bertha, ah, you sound like a parrot. Go, go to her. Bertha hangs up the phone.